Hello, and welcome to the BISA webinar. I'm Nathan Wood, Chairman of BISA's Health and Wellbeing in Buildings Group and Managing Director of Farmwood M&E Ventilation Services. Happy New Year to you all, and uh, congratulations to the latest three members joining BISA on the previous slides. So today we're going to be discussing, is UVC the answer for tackling airborne infections in buildings? And with growing pressure on the industry, I'm going to start that again, so I've just gone big screen. Hello and welcome to the BISA webinar. I'm Nathan Wood, Chairman of BISA's Health and Wellbeing in Buildings Group and Managing Director of Farmwood M&E and Ventilation Services. Happy New Year to you all and congratulations to the three latest members joining BISA shown on the previous slides. So today we're going to be discussing, is UVC the answer for tackling airborne infections in buildings? So with growing pressure on the industry to deliver a wider range of solutions capable of reducing the threat of airborne disease transmission in buildings, I'm delighted to welcome back SAGE member and leading expert on ventilation and indoor air quality, Professor Kathy Noakes. Welcome, Kathy. If you could turn on your camera. Can you hear me, Hi, Kathy? Nathan. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it was great to see you in the team on the uh, Royal Institute Christmas lecture, but I do hope you managed to have a bit of downtime as well over Christmas. A little bit. <laughs> Good. OK. Um, well, we've got a lot to get through. You've got your presentation lined up and then we'll have some fantastic Q&A at the end. Um, and just to let everybody know that the presentation will be available and emailed through separately. So um, I'll disappear. Over to you, Cathy. Uh, hopefully you can see my slides. Yep. Indeed, yes. Brilliant. OK. Great. OK, so yes. Yeah, so today I want to talk about, let me just try and minimise uh, my uh, image. Um, today I want to talk about UVC in buildings. So I want to use this to give a bit of an overview of uh, UVC in buildings and um, some of the approaches we can use and what some of the evidence is for us to look at this. Okay, so uh, before I go into um, ultraviolet though, I want to just start by thinking about the principle of what we're trying to achieve with air cleaning strategies in buildings. So um, if we look at what we know about transmission of um, respiratory diseases, um, it's not a simple thing of, you know, it's all in the air or it's all on the surface or it's, it's all close range. There's a whole complexity of how the virus transmits. It's in a range of different size aerosols and some large droplets. And the physics of this depends it basically determines how far those um, aerosols and droplets can travel and where we might get exposed to them. So we know, or we think we know for, for SARS-CoV-2 now that um, there is a, if you're ex close to somebody who is infectious, then you have a, a fairly high probability that you will inhale the virus that they exhale because you're exposed to all of the different sizes of aerosols that they emit and some of their um, ballistic large droplets that they also emit. If you're sharing air with that person in the same room, you can also be exposed. Those tend to be the smallest aerosols which remain airborne for long periods of time, but can disperse in a space in a room. And we also know that there's some evidence that that can be transmitted into neighbouring rooms as well. Fomites looks like it's um, a, a pretty minor route, but we can't discount it. And there is still a probability that some, a small number of infections are from touching contaminated surfaces. We certainly know that people with COVID can contaminate an awful lot of surfaces in their environments. So when we think about air cleaners and any form of air cleaning where they come in, they are effective against these long range aerosols in the shared air in the room and potentially into other rooms. They could have some impact on fomite routes because they could reduce the amount of deposition onto surfaces. However, if it's a small route anyway, it's probably not going to change things that significantly, although it could be more important for other diseases. 
it will uh, though have quite a limited effect on this very close range transmission. So when you particularly once you get within about a meter of somebody, your exposure is really dominated by the physics of the airflow in that range. And unless you've got a, 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 an air scrubber that's right next to you, you're unlikely to have a, an impact on that, that transmission through the air cleaning. So first of all, clean putting air cleaners in is not a magic bullet. It means that it, it's one, it mitigates one of the routes of transmission, but it doesn't mitigate everything. And it's really important we remember that. It's not a case of we put this in, we're now safe. It's, it's all about reducing risk rather than removing risk. Um, we think as well about where this fits with a, a hierarchy of, of control. Um, and um, in this hierarchy of control, you know, there are things which we know will be very effective if we all work from home, if we all isolate, um, we don't do anything, we have a lockdown, we know that we, we reduce transmission, it's inevitable, but we know that we can't do that all the time and it just becomes impractical. So we have to do other um, things to reduce transmission risk. Engineering controls sit firmly in the middle of this, you know, they're not as effective as lockdowns, but they potentially are more effective than some of the administrative controls that we can use because they don't rely quite so much on human behaviour. If it's designed well, they're there as background without us having to interact, remember what to do all the time. Um, I have also touched briefly on PPE and masks in here. Masks used as a source control is uh, a tricky one to position in a hierarchy of control. I might almost argue it's engineering masks used as protection is PPE and the reason it's down at the bottom is not because they're not effective they are incredibly effective but they do rely on people to wear them properly because they're ineffective if people don't. So when we think about technology routes the engineering routes to to mitigate transmission the first thing we do is not jump in straight away and say let's ventilate the room the first thing we do is say well can we remove the source of the pathogen and I think we, we, we mustn't forget that, that, ha that that's a really important step in this, because actually if we can, in a healthcare setting, isolate somebody, we can test them and put them in an isolation space, or we can use source control masks. Actually, that's the first step because you reduce how much goes into the air in the first place. But then, here, then the ventilation comes in. And so I think I would always put ventilation above air cleaning technologies, not necessarily because it's more effective, but because we need it for other reasons. Um, and then put the air cleaning technology. And again, that respiratory protection, the respiratory masks, um, FFP3 type masks to manage your exposure um, are, the are, are the last step. But of course, if you have to be close to people who have COVID, then you need them because it's the only way you can manage that risk. So I touched already on ventilation versus air cleaning. And I think we, we need to make sure we don't mix the two up. They serve different purposes. So ventilation has multiple purposes. It dilutes and removes all sorts of contaminants. That includes the exhaled CO2, which when it gets high, uh, the after lunch CO2 when you, you all feel a bit sleepy. It does manage thermal comfort, it manages odour, it manages humidity. So there are very a lot of reasons we need ventilation regardless of COVID. Air cleaning is only about contaminants. So, so and some will only remove certain contaminants and UVC is one of those. It is only a biological mechanism. It does have some effect on air chemistry, but it's predominantly a biological mechanism. It doesn't deal with particles. Whereas if you want to remove particulates, then filters are, are what you need. So I think it's very important that we say, actually, it, it's, it's not an excuse to not ventilate. It's not a substitute for good ventilation. We should still be aiming for good ventilation. But we do know that it can be hard to increase ventilation in some buildings and it can be hard to maintain it year round in some buildings. So that's where the air cleaning comes in as an effective alternative or as a boost to that ventilation. The other thing to think about with all air cleaning is where do we put it? Do we put it in the, in the HVAC system? Do we put it in the room? If we put it in the HVAC system, we are providing clean supply air to that room. So if we have a, a, an HVAC that recirculates, then that is beneficial. Or if we have particularly high risk immune compromised patients in a hospital who need very clean air, are susceptible to 
the, the microbial spores and things that are in outdoor air, then we might want to, to use that. But it is not as effective at managing contaminant sources in the room um, unless it's of a sufficiently high ventilation rate. Putting your air cleaning device in the room deals with those local contaminant sources. So it provides effectively additional air change rates, equivalent air change rates to the room beyond that the, the ventilation system supplies, but of course it doesn't affect the supply air to that room. So what we're really going to talk about, well, we will actually talk about both types, the sort of things you might put in ducts and the sort of things you might put in rooms today. So moving on to UV itself, um, I've called it germicidal UV um, here. Um, you will also see if in other documents, it's also known as ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. The, 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 the phrase germicidal UV tends to be used a little bit more readily these days because simply because the word irradiation actually is frightens people um, and you feel they're being irradiated. So we tend to use but basically it is um, uh, electromagnetic radiation in the UVC part of the spectrum. So you've got there the, the, um, the electromagnetic spectrum, which I'm sure you all remember from high school physics. Um, so we have a germicidal range within UVC which is a between, so UVC itself is about 100 nanometers to 280 nanometers. The germicidal range is from about 220 nanometers in there. There are, is another range around about 180 nanometers, which is also germicidal, but it's germicidal because it produces ozone rather than because it's inherently germicidal. So we're not looking at that one, that's quite useful for, for some um, water disinfection um, approaches, but not for air cleaning approaches. So what does UV do? So UV is a biological mechanism, it's not a physical removal, um, and it basically damages the DNA of um, the, the, of, of bacteria or the RNA of viruses. So it, within there, you've got these, uh, it breaks the strands and it forms these things called dimers. And it basically puts a disruption into the RNA or DNA and it stops the, the microorganism from replicating. So it doesn't actually kill it as such, it stops it being able to replicate and therefore inactivates it. And it there's worth remembering it does not physically remove it so it will still be present in the environment but dead. Um, in some cases particularly bacteria some bacteria can actually repair themselves so if you've got a sublethal dose of UVC they can reactivate there's a process called photoreactivation where they can mend their DNA um, and reactivate again so you know it's 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 not a magic bullet solution uh, and we need to make sure we get the right dose for the right microorganism and I think this is a really important take is that the impact depends on the wavelength of light that's used and it depends on the microorganism so some microorganisms behave differently to others. Um, it's well worth mentioning safety so we will normally use UV at 254 nanometers and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute why. Um, and that is hazardous. It damages, if you're directly exposed to it, it, it you get a, a, a nasty case of sunburn um, and you can get nasty inflammation of uh, the eye. Um, these are not usually sort of life threatening or anything, they're short lived, but they, they are nasty, they're painful for several days and it would be, you would not want to be exposed to it. So we need to make sure that whatever we put in a building doesn't allow any direct exposure to that UVC without protection. Um, it's also important that um, any UV devices do come under the artificial optical um, radiation regulations, um, have a look at those, and you have to think about how you demonstrate the, the safety of the device if you're a manufacturer or um, the safety of the installation if you're um, in putting these in, in workplaces. So some devices, if the UV is all enclosed in a box, would become as a class zero and so would not be cause much problem at all. Others which are upper room type devices with open UV would come under, I think it's a class three device and they are, um, they do need a, a much stricter risk assessment in there. 
Uh, there are some guidelines for exposure. Most people use the NIOSH guideline. Um, so this was developed over studies looking at um, using UV for tuberculosis and particularly an upper room UV. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, what that is. Um, and they set a, a guideline exposure of what that means of uh, the maximum irradiance that you can have. Um, I'll talk a bit about far UV a, a later on, but there is another new approach basically, and it is potentially much safer. So that's something to keep a watch on. Um, I've touched a bit on lamp uh, on emissions already. So um, most UV um, uses low pressure lamps. Um, so these are um, like a they look like a fluorescent tube lamp. A lot of them are mercury lamps. They have a, a particular um, glass which prevents emission of ozone but allows the right UV spectrums to be emitted. And if you look at the graph, you can see a, a typical spectral emission from a, a low pressure and medium pressure UV lamp and the germicidal effectiveness. And basically the peak effectiveness, the, um, the bit where you get the best, the most DNA damage is around about 260 nanometers and the peak emissions that you get from these low pressure lamps are at 254 nanometers which is pretty close to that peak of the germicidal effectiveness which is why we use that particular wavelength. Um, so, mo so most lamps are these low pressure lamps you can get LED lamps now. Um, some plus points of LED lamps is they have a, a very focused wavelength so you don't get these stray wavelengths that can potentially cause other, other issues, um, but they are still very low in efficiency at the moment. So I think it's a, it's a technology that will develop and will improve, um, but there's, they are, there are some good devices out there, but they, they are uh, less effective at the moment. And of course, being a lamp, um, some of you will remember from studying building services and lighting, it is lighting. So the irradiance that you get from these lamps is governed by inverse square laws. The further you get away from the lamp, the, the, more, the, the more it drops off. What do we know about how effective they are? Well, we know from things like decontamination in food processing, pharma, um, pharmaceutical industries, using labs, and water disinfection, it works. We know it works. We, and then if we think about um, surfaces and air in buildings, there's loads of lab studies out there which show that you can inactivate microorganisms. Um, that includes now a number of studies around coronavirus, I think including the SARS-CoV-2 virus. In terms of does it reduce transmission of infection, which is a slightly different question to does it kill a microorganism in a lab, um, there has been, they're much harder to show, but there have been a handful of clinical type trials, uh, mostly looking around TB transmission. So um, uh, Wells and Riley in the 50s and 60s carried out studies where they basically put, uh, uh, took the air from a TB ward, passed it through houses with uh, cages of guinea pigs and included UV disinfection in uh, lamps in the um, wards and less guinea pigs got infected. Um, so it demonstrated the effectiveness of, of UV and more recently we we did uh, studies in Peru around uh, 10, 10, 12 years ago and there have been studies in South Africa which show the same effect for TB. Less in data out there for other pathogens but there are some sort of higher quality studies which do show um, the, the impact of, of UV and it of course it, it will it will work. It's the question is, is how much does it reduce transmission by is, is more difficult to answer. So UV is quite complex. It's not something that you, you know, plug and play. You do have to think quite carefully about the effectiveness. And there are a lot of different factors which will affect the performance of a UVC system. So the lamps themselves, where you position them, um, the airflow that passes those lamps, um, all determine how much exposure um, microorganisms get. Um, the, the performance is, is, uh, of the lamps is affected by the temperature of the air, it's affected by the reflectivity of surfaces, um, and reflectivity for UV is not the same as for visible light, so just because it's shiny for visible light doesn't necessarily mean it's shiny for UV. Um, and it depends on the pathogens themselves and those pathogens are then affected in turn by the environmental conditions, so relative humidity. Um, we can look at um, 
the behaviour, so we can, through lab studies, we understand quite a lot about how pathogens are inactivated over time when exposed to UV. Many of them follow a first order decay, not all, some follow different, different decay um, profiles, but most of them follow a first order decay, which is, shows on the, the right, which is um, just an exponential. And um, it, they're determined essentially by the UV dose, which is sometimes called the fluence that, that they're exposed to, which is basically the UV irradiance from the lamp multiplied by the time of exposure. Um, so that's all governed by the engineering system, the lamps and the flow. And then the microorganisms. So the, the susceptibility, different microorganisms have different susceptibilities uh, to UV. Some are harder to inactivate than others. And some are harder to, most of them are harder to inactivate under higher humidity conditions. So unlike a filter, where it will have the same performance on just about any microorganism providing it's of a particular size, a UV device will have a different performance on different microorganisms. And we can show this here with, um, this is a collation of um, survival versus UV dose uh, for a whole range of different bacteria. Um, and you can see some quite big differences. If I drew a line at a dose just about around about 100, um, meter square per joule, you can see that, you know, the very top line um, is B subcellus in, in spore form, that is, has, you know, it, hardly any of that's been inactivated, whereas if we go about four lines down, which is uh, the yellow, one well, with the yellow boxes, which is the, the same microorganism actually in vegetative cells, um, it's inactivated much more. And you can see across there, we've got some really quite big variations in um, inactivation rates for different microorganisms. Um, I haven't got viruses on this one, um, but viruses tend to be relatively easy to inactivate. The hardest ones to inactivate are fungal spores. So let's think about how we can implement UV. There are some different ways we can do this. Um, so within a room, we can have enclosed units where the UV is basically inside a box with a self-contained fan, draws air through that box, passes it over the UV and passes it back out to the room. And that can be in the form of, of something that's installed, so a little bit like a, um, an air conditioner unit or a portable unit that's standalone and plug in. So both of those will, will achieve the same objective um, albeit might have different flow rates, different um, sizes of units and, um, and slightly different usages. Um, we can have open UV for disinfection. I'm not going to talk about that. It's a very different application, but essentially where you have a completely open field and you do this in an unoccupied room to disinfect surfaces in a room. But that's a very different application. I've already touched slightly on upper room. So upper room UV is where we have a device installed either on a high on a wall or hanging from a ceiling, which generates a field of UV light, an open field of UV light above the heads of the occupants. So the idea there is you get this high intensity UV field high up in a room and the convection currents in the, in the room, the air mixing in the room allows microorganisms to be um, passed through that field, inactivated, and then pass, the air is passed back down to the people in the room. And um, this is where exposure limits come in because it's impossible to eliminate absolutely all UV in that lower zone. So we have to make sure that it's, as, it's very, very low. So it's, um, it's below exposure limits and doesn't cause any issues. So which one do we go for? Do we have an enclosed system or an upper room system? So enclosed systems, um, they are safe systems. There's no exposure to the UV, um, particularly if it's a, a portable unit, it's incredibly easy to install. install. It's a little bit like a, filter, a portable filter, plug it in and off you go. Um, obviously it's a bit more involved if you're having an installed unit in a ceiling. Um, they can perform similarly to filter units, so uh, it will depend on the design of the unit, but providing they've got sufficient UV irradiance, sufficient dwell time through the unit, you can easily get something like two air changes an hour 
for each unit you install in the classroom. So a little bit like a filter, if you put three or so in a classroom, you might get somewhere close to somewhere between three and six air changes an hour equivalent, additional um, equivalent ventilation rate in there. Maintenance of them are really simple. So you would have to, you have to keep an eye on the, whether the lamps um, are still working, but they typically you'd have an annual lamp change and clean, and they will have a filter in them as well. Disadvantage is that they can be noisy. Um, and there's a, a bit of a conundrum here because a good design of a unit has, is really reflective inside, but of course that's not very good for noise buff, um, uh, reduction. So they, they, that is a challenge with design of these units. Upper room systems um, are silent or pretty much silent. Um, they um, can give you very high air changes per hour, you know, 20 or above sometimes, um, but they do need sufficient ceiling height for it to work and no obstruction. So there are a lot of spaces where it'd be great to install them, but actually you've got protruding beams coming down from the ceiling, the ceiling's too low, there's no electrical services, it becomes a challenge. And it needs a specialist design install. It's not a plug and play solution. Um, so it needs to be thought through, but it can be incredibly effective. And again, maintenance is pretty simple. You have, do have to be a little bit careful with the maintenance of them because there's potential for exposure um, for the person who's doing that maintenance. Um, how do we actually assess these things though? So one of the challenges with a UV unit rather than the filter is that you have to do biological testing of it. Um, and there's a number of different ways in which we can understand their performance. So we can do this sort of very fundamental lab studies, looking at the, the microorganism susceptibility, looking at safety studies. Um, we can then do controlled performance studies, and these are probably the most important stage because we can then test against bioaerosols and look at how effective the devices are. If we have some knowledge of performance, we can use some modeling based studies. They, it, it sounds quite simple to do computational fluid dynamics. I'm going to show you some in a minute. It's actually quite complex, um, but you can use some of these to look at performance and look at things like cost benefit. And then, of course, we can get real world data, which are, but that's much harder to come by, requires some quite big studies to, to deliver. Um, just to give you an idea of how we might test some of these, because we've tested all sorts of things in Leeds with our in biologically. Um, if you've got a, a duct based system or some form of enclosed system, you can test it by um, nebulizing a particular microorganism into the airstream and sampling, testing that with and without a device in operation. That allows you to calculate how much reduction you've got and the variability in that. And again, that will depend on your device, your flow rate, your microorganism, your lamp outputs. Um, and you also have to think about how the test rig captures the flow and the bioaerosol behavior properly. So are you sampling properly using proper sampling methods for that? Um, what we can also do, and is probably more valuable for most of the devices, is in room type testing. So we nebulize a microorganism into a room and sample by with take bioaerosol samples with and without a device operational. And we can then calculate either the percentage that it reduces the steady state by or the difference in the decay time. So two different approaches here is we can test under steady state conditions. We, subject it to continuous source contamination. Without a device, we switch the device on, we get another steady state um, and we've got the difference between the two. That's actually representative of what happens in many real rooms. You've got continuous occupancy and continuous contamination at environment. You can also do decay tests. So you can look at how does your device um, change the speed at which um, uh, the bio microbes are removed from the air um, with and without the device switched on. So and give you the difference between the two. So beware when you're looking at test data because some people produce steady state data, other people produce decay data. Usually people produce decay data because they can always say it removed 99.9% .9 how it just how long it took it to do it. So be careful of that, beware of the test conditions. So when you see somebody who says, my device is brilliant, look at actually what did they do? What species of microorganisms they tested? Is it a really easy one that's gonna, uh, gonna be inactivated with no problem at all? 
Did they test it in a room? Did they test it under different temperature and humidity conditions? Did they, um, did they consider the effects of the, of the device on its own or on top of ventilation? Um, so it's, it's, it's not sort of as simple as it's going to remove everything because you always ask the question of, well, exactly what was done. One of the real challenges with this, and I appreciate a lot of people have struggled with this, is that you need biocontainment facilities to do those biological tests. And those facilities are few and far between. Um, there are also no standards for testing, so um, it's hard to compare between different devices and different products because every, every supplier has provided something different. So I want to show you some of the research that we've done on UV devices. Most of this is modeling work. Um, I'll start with induct devices, but a lot of this applies to enclosed systems too. So here we've got a system where uh, you can see in a duct, we've got a lamp across a duct. Um, we, it would have, there would be filters in there, there would be a fan, and we're looking at the airstream passing over one or more lamps inside a duct. Um, there are num lots of different factors that come into play in here as to what how how this performs, including the lamps, the airflow, the materials of the duct and its shape, the um, microorganisms that are involved and temperatures and humidity. So we've looked at this through a computational fluid dynamics fluid um, dynamics modeling approach. This was done by a, a former PhD student, uh, Azael Capetillo, who, who did a fantastic job looking at the, 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 the detail of these. So we've modelled a section of duct. So on the right, you can see a short section of square duct, and there's a, a lamp that a, 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 um, sits um, perpendicular to the duct. Um, we model the three-dimensional UV field that arises from that lamp, um, and we use a radiative transfer equation method uh, with something called a discrete, discrete ordinates model, which actually models that, that field for us and can model the reflectivity as well. Um, then we use what we call Lagrangian particle tracks. So we seed it in the, in the model with these particle tracks that, that represent the, the paths that different parts that uh, microorganisms would take as they go through the duct. And as they go through, we calculate the, the, the dose that those particles receive and we can then put that through a, 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 a biological survival model. Um, so essentially, you may imagine if you're a particle traveling through this duct, as you start to approach that UV light, you would go through the outer, the, the, the outer layers of that, that field, you would start to get an exposure, you'd get a peak exposure as you pass the UV light, and then it decays off again as it goes down the duct. So you get quite a, a long duration of exposure in there. And we started by comparing um, the CFD models with test data from the US EPA. So they tested against three different microorganisms, Serratia marcescens, MS2, which is often used as a viral surrogate, and Beatrophis, which is also called B. subtilis. Um, and you can see in the table at the top that our CFD uh, overall percentage effectiveness of the models were pretty close to what the EPA had um, measured in their experiments. But what the CFD allows us to look at is the behavior of what really happens in there. So what we can get is a distribution. So on the, the left, lower left, it shows the UV lamp across the center of the duct. So the X and the Y would be the, the, the duct. And it shows the particles that have received more than the average dose. And they're the particle tracks at the end of the duct that have basically gone closest to the lamp. And when we look at the distribution of dose that all of the particles that travel down that duct received, it's in the graph on the lower right, which is, you can see we've got this distribution. So if we were to do an experiment, we might say, well, we've got, you know, 39% reduction and we've got an average dose of just under 10 um, joules per square meter. But that doesn't quite represent what really happens because you've got this, this tail in both directions so um, here is our average dose what you can see is a big chunk of those particles get less than the average dose and then a small number quite a long tail get much higher than the average dose so if this was the dose you needed to inactivate what you're going to find is that basically your system is inefficient your system is some pathogens are getting far more than they need which is inefficient and others are under 
which means they're not it's not effective enough so this starts to then think about design of a system because ideally what we want is quite a sharp peak in here we want to get everything close to the ideal so we can look at this in a bit more detail we've got the same scenario here one lamp and we've got it now perpendicular to the duct and parallel to the duct and what you see is that if you put it parallel to the duct at the same flow rate you get a much higher average dose for starters but we get quite distinctive characteristics for our particles so each dot on these graphs is a particle that's gone down this duct and we're plotting the residence time of the particles versus the uv dose they receive and you can see when it's perpendicular that they all cluster quite closely together but when it's a parallel lamp you get some which get a, a very high dose with a short residence time and some with a very high residence time and a much smaller dose so it, you get these quite distinctive characteristic behaviors of the systems and we can then look at multiple lamps so we've got two cases here where we've got three lamps in a row in a um, spaced out in, a, in a, a row horizontally versus three lamps spaced out vertically we can see that the average dose is pretty similar in both it's, it's not much in it at all but you can see that where they're spaced vertically we get this much sharper peak of, of dose spectrum compared to the one where they're spaced out along the length of the duct which is telling us that it's a more efficient system and we're getting less under and over um, the average in there so the system design uh, can, can actually impact what you get out of it quite significantly and this also applies for the microbial inactivation and what we've done here is model some different systems in fact it's the, th the the systems that you've just seen the 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 single lamp and the three lamp systems and we've modeled it for different microorganism susceptibility ranges and what we tend to see for example you compare the perfect one lamp cases the perpendicular and the parallel the parallel one always slightly overperforms but as microorganisms get tougher which takes you to the right the harder to inactivate then that becomes more and more important. So when your microorganisms are really easy to inactivate, it doesn't matter as much. The harder they are to inactivate, the more the design of the system matters. Um, and you know, the, the hardest ones are the, the, the ones where we've got um, B subtilis is a pretty tough one to inactivate. I've put some typical uh, inactivation coefficients there. And you can see there's order of magnitude difference in some of those microorganisms. So that's enclosed UV. I now want to talk a bit about upper room UV. Um, and this adds, takes the same challenges and adds a whole different extra set of complexities because instead of now having a well-defined flow down a duct, um, we've now got a really complex three-dimensional flow in a room and a three-dimensional light field in a room. Um, so it's a much harder thing to model and to size correctly so as i said before we've got these lamps above the head we're creating a a, a, a distinctive shielded uv zone and we've, we've looked at how we can model the 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 behaviors of these devices so one of the first things we did was to measure what we got out of these devices so you can see from the photograph on the right that's a, a typical wall mounted lamp um, it's like a uh, the lamp has a set of um, it's called black painted louvers which great create a, a collimated beam so instead of that the lamp um, output being dispersed in the room it comes out in quite a narrow beam and you can see it because there is some visible light as well as the uv light from that lamp um, so we took uh, measured that data at different angles um, in the in the room and used that to produce empirical models of the uv field which we could then put into our computational um, fluid dynamics models we can model the airflow patterns so here we've got a, a, a this is a small chamber so that's our biological chamber at leeds where we have the air inlet at the high on a high wall and outlet on a, a low wall both both wall mounted um sort of standard diffusers and then we've got two uv lamps in here one on a short a small lamp on the, the short wall and a longer lamp on the, the longer wall um, both indicated by the gray boxes 
and we can measure model then what happens as the air interacts with that lamp so what we're representing here is a fee the the the, cons the contour pots are, are the uv dose within the room and what you see as you might expect this was just with the short uv device switched on that you get the highest dose for the air that's closest passes closest to the um device um, the lowest dose is at the air inlet because that's the clean air coming into the room and it hasn't had time to collect any dose yet. But then you get this sort of distribution throughout the room, which basically tells you that the evenness of this distribution tells you how much of the room air has passed through or been exposed to that UV lamp under particular conditions. And we can use this to model the uh, effectiveness of different uh, combinations of devices. So we can look at, um, here we've got where it says in low or in high, that's two different ventilation regimes. So do we put the air in low or do we put the air in high and how many UV fixtures? And what we always see in these ones um, for this particular setup is that when we put the air in low and out high, we actually get a better um, in activation than if we put the air in high and out low. And that's to do with the different mixing pattern in the room under the different circumstances. So it is basically telling us that, that the, the effectiveness of these devices depends not just on the specification of the devices, but also on the ventilation system that's present in the room that enables the air to mix between the lower zone and the upper zone of the room. So they're really quite complex systems um, to, in the terms of their mechanisms. So that's conventional 254 nanometer. And I just want to touch finally on far UV. So far UV is a little bit different. It is emitting at um, a, a lower wavelength. It's at 222 nanometers. Um, it's come about because we've now got um, particular uh, lamps which can deliver it. So these are uh, a krypton chloride lamps which um, put out at 222 nanometers. Um, we know it can inactivate on surfaces and in air, but the real benefit of far UV is potentially it's a lot safer. So you don't get those skin and eye impacts that you get with 254. So potentially this could deliver us something quite different. Um, this just shows you some of the penetration depths. So it's showing the wavelength of, of light versus the depth it penetrates down into the, the layers of skin. So the, the stratum corneums are just the very top layer of skin that protects it's when it gets into the epidermis that we start to really worry. And if we look at where uh, 222 is, you can see that you, you really don't get any, any penetration down into the epidermis layer. If we put 254 on there, you start to see there's, there's more significant penetration of that light down into the skin. So it is much safer. And of course, what we, what, um, we can um, filter these lights to make sure they, they produce at a particular wavelength um, spectrum. So there's lots of studies now have looked at the safety of this. Um, my slides fail. Uh, we can't hear you at the moment. Drop in there, I think. Uh, Thanks, Nick. Warners at the beginning that uh, she might have a few technical problems, but she assured us she would drop back in. So just to say, while we're waiting, we've had some fantastic questions coming through. We'll do our very best to, to make our way through as many of these as we can. Um, obviously, Kathy is extremely busy, but we will try to persuade her to, to carry on the discussion. The questions in a few seconds be rejoined by Kathy. Uh, but I hope I do hope that everybody's taking uh, lots away from this. I, I mean, certainly the amount of schools that I've been taking down to the points. I mean, it's it's interesting that there that the safety and that there is no silver bullet reducing the risk. Not the, 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 I uh, I've got you, go. am I back in? I don't know what happened. It threw me out. You're okay, you're okay, okay. So, um, your, slides, your slides are showing on safety at the moment. 
Okay, um, do you want to put me, oh, I haven't got my, is it still doing the screen share on me? I don't think it is. Um, do you want me to start sharing my screen from that slide for you? Can you, can you just allow me to um, One second, screen let me just share, share back up again? Um, uh, okay. Okay. Just giving it back to you now, one second. Okay, it's coming back to you. Okay, apologies for that. I've skipped over that slide, but basically there were lots of studies that showed safety, but I think that slide did something weird to it and killed it. Um, so yeah, apologies for that. Um, so just to show there are some really studies now which are showing that um, the far UV can be really effective at inactivating microorganisms, including SARS-CoV-2. Um, so we know it works. And then um, we've actually very recently done a set of um, initial um, room scale studies using uh, these uh, far UV devices. We had to do these using a bacteria because we can't test using viruses, um, but um, essentially they gave us a really good inactivation rate, even at the current exposure limits that are allowable for these devices. Um, and it's a performance that, you know, is equivalent to putting, I mean, this was a, in a chamber, which is a three, has a ventilation rate of three air changes an hour and it upped it to 35 air changes an hour. So, you know, if I was to put a portable air cleaner in, it would give me, say, 15. So it's well above what we're getting for, for portable air cleaners. So just to finish up, is this the answer? So it's not a magic bullet. It is ventilation is part of mitigation and GUV is part of that answer, but it can't solve a fundamentally unventilated space if you've got a poorly ventilated space guv might um improve your reduce your risk of pathogen exposure but it won't deal with poorly ventilated um, if we've got enclosed units they are much easier um, but they are less effective than upper room and it's all about finding the right system for the right space we also know that i think it's really important to re remember that uv is pathogen specific so it will be a different performance for different microorganisms and that performance is complex um, and we have to think about safety um, i think there's an awful lot we know already and so for 254 nanometer actually it's much more about making sure we've got the right standards making sure we've got the right guidance and making sure that, that we devices that are available have the right evidence for their performance um, I think there is a little bit of research needed around further air quality impacts of the fact that they can sometimes lead to secondary pollutants, but that's a relatively uh, low risk for this technology. It's been around a long time. The 222 nanometer far UV has some massive promise. Um, I'm not sure it's quite ready for just simple deployment. Off we go. But I think there is with probably not very much more research. Uh, we'll get a good understanding of it. We'll get the right sort of guidelines up. Uh, it is very expensive at the moment, but of course, all these things come down in price. And then I think LED technology, there's some real opportunities for development there too. And that will probably change the landscape of UV. It is starting to do already, and I think it will change it as we go further forward. Um, last thing I want to mention is, I know many of you are aware that we are running a study, uh, a, a real world study. We've got a 30 primary schools in the Bradford area. That's over, I think it's about 540 classrooms in total. Um, some of those don't have any devices at all. They just have ventilation. Some of them have um, filter units in. So we'll have three filter units. Others have active air, so these enclosed uh, UV devices. Um, up to nine in some rooms, because the bigger rooms require quite a lot. So not a straightforward study. We're measuring air quality parameters in every single room. So that's a lot of um, air quality monitoring gone in and a lot of data. Um, we are measuring infection rates and absence, um, including COVID trans rates um, as they're reported to the schools. Um, and I think the most important short term is that we're looking at the practicalities of putting in these air cleaning devices into these rooms, which you know already we're seeing. It is not always straightforward. Simple things like do you have enough plug sockets can be a, a bit of a challenge. So just remember it's useful, but there's no magic bullets out there. 
a lot of people to say thank you to because this is not all my work there's a lot of people who've been involved in research around the the uv side of things um and testing the school in schools and um and say any questions and hand over back to um nathan Kathy, thank you so much that was um there was a lot to take in let me put it that way um sorry yeah there was quite a line there wasn't there <laughs> There was a lot in there yeah I've, I've got lots of scribble we've got loads and loads of questions as well and i did just touch on the fact that may try and get you to pick up a few more links in if you get two seconds spare at all but, um, yeah i don't mind if we run over a bit as well if you i've got a bit of time if you want to run over okay great um so there's a load of questions i think there's a good one that came in um saying that do the installers need to be certified uv professionals to deal with the level of equipment that we're talking about taking into consideration the safety aspects um uh, there's talk of um interlocks being required with the hvac systems and the like so is is there a, a competency level that people need to be looking for with their teams so there isn't a scheme there isn't a a, a particular competency level i think you know, I, I think if, if someone's supplying you with portable enclosed units, I wouldn't be too worried at all. If somebody's supplying you with upper room UV systems, I would be really looking to see if they know what they're doing because they they have to know all of the safety standards. They have, and you're right, interlocks so that if you, um, you know, if, if a, a lot of these devices have, have something that if a person comes, you know, if, if the UV field is blocked, it cuts it out straight away. Um, interlocks to, for maintenance. Um, and yeah, you should be looking to see that these are companies that really know what they're doing. Um, that's great. You, you, you touched on air cleaners there, and there's, there's another question about the location of these portable air cleaners. I've got a very strong point of view on this one, but you're here to do the talking, not me. So it's, it, we, we see a lot of them, especially with the schools at the moment, scrambling over themselves for the funding. Um, location is key. Yeah, location matters. I mean, I, I don't know that it actually matters as much as people we always think it does but i think you want to make sure that you've got a, a sufficient clean air delivery rate from a unit and that um most spaces you're better off with uh three or four smaller units than you are with one big unit because you want to distribute the air well in the space and if you put one small unit in a corner by the window it's not really going to do anything so i mean i think i would say distribute them around the room and if you can keep them away from the windows because you want to be cleaning the air that's perhaps not just come in from the window. Good point, yeah. you, practicality you there's practicality of where your plug sockets are often overrides everything. Yes, and safety of extension leads. And yeah, and don't block them, don't don't put curtains over them, don't put things in front of them, don't put everything on top of them. Yeah. Um, you mentioned clean air delivery rates. Previously yeah. you mentioned uh, air changes per hour. Um, yeah. depending on the marketeering of the people selling the products they're poised in different ways and I think there's lots of people out there that are trying to distinguish the difference between the two and what standards are required but in in your opinion with with clean air delivery rates and the way that these systems are advertised a lot of the time and one of the questions is specifically is the clean air delivery rates are pitched at the maximum speed and it's very rare that you would have the run at that level yeah always look at it is what's the clean air delivery rate at the speed you're going to run at and for a, a filter unit clean air delivery rate is an appropriate um parameter um and of course you can use a clean air delivery rate to calculate the equivalent ventilation flow rate or air change rate or whatever number you want to use to for the, your room for a UV device, clean air delivery rate is a less certain parameter because you will get a different clean air delivery rate for a different microorganism. So you might get a, you know, you might get 300 for your um, for your flu virus, and you might only get 100 for your um, aspergillus spores. So. And I just made those numbers up, <laughs> so don't hold me to those numbers. But you might you might get really quite different performance for different microorganisms. So it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to just um, deal with respiratory viruses in a school classroom, 
they are probably a more narrow performance. But if you're trying to deal with hospital acquired infections, there's a big range out there. Um, for people looking to further develop their skill set, can you maybe three key points of emphasis? Sorry, I can't hear you very well, Nathan. You're breaking up. Hi, Nathan. Yeah, we can't we can't hear you for some reason. No, no, it's still not very. Not very good. Yeah. Hear me now. Yes. Yeah, you know. Sorry about that. Um, I was saying the um, David Fries has coined the ventilation industry as the Cinderella sector, um, the forgotten trades. But with people looking to upskill and learn and develop more into this um, indoor air quality environment, is there any main pointers that you could give them where to look? Is there any new um, training and competency coming through that you're aware of? Um, there's not a huge amount. There's a, I met through IMAC E. We run a, a course um, two or three times a year. Next one's coming up on, I think, the, the week starting 14th of February. So, um, I, so just have a look on IMACI's website for that one. Um, that does include some stuff on UV uh, and air cleaning as well as general ventilation. Um, it, it, there's not that much else and I, I'm aware of in terms of training, um, other than obviously BISA runs plenty of things. Um, in terms of guidance, if you want to know more about UV, uh, there's a little bit in SIBSI A. Um, otherwise go and look for ASHRAE documents. So there's some ASHRAE documents and there's some NIOSH documents and particularly around upper room UV. It's well worth doing a good read around the, the, the guidance on those. Um, a lot of it's written for tuberculosis control rather than anything else, but it's a good starting place. Uh, and actually TB susceptibility is not a million miles away from um, SARS-CoV-2 susceptibility. So if you were to design a system for UV, uh, sorry, for TB, you're pretty close to where you need to be. Okay. Uh, another quick question here, and we, we are running out of time. Um, in terms of the way in which the systems are marketed, be that in ducts and um, in room systems, the, the advertisement for the 99, the magic nines, the 99.99 recurring or wherever they pitch it, um, how, how are the consumers or the people looking to specify these systems able to distinguish whether or not that is a single air pass or whether it's multiple passes that have been chosen? That information is sometimes very lacking in the documentation shared. You're right, it is really hard. I mean, in a and you have to look at what they've tested it against or what they've modelled it against. So uh, in duct systems, it will inevitably be a single pass. Um, and yeah, it will be, um, and an awful lot of those systems are actually sold to keep cooling coils clean as opposed to the, for air disinfection purposes. Um, the in-room units, most people use a decay type test. Um, and so actually I would always say, look at, when it says it's reduced it by 99.9% in 60 minutes, Go back to your basic calculations and say, OK, if I had two air changes an hour in that room or six air changes an hour in that room, look at the size of their test room. How long would I expect it to get down to that percentage reduction? And sometimes you see these devices and they look it looks really good because it says 99.9 percent .9 or whatever. But in actual fact, you would have achieved exactly the same with two air changes an hour in your room. So try and back calculate from that. Lovely. Well, we're out of time. Um, Cathy, thank you ever so much for the, the, the detailed presentation. We got through the little hiccups on there as well. Yeah, um, thank you, everybody, for, for doing this. And that's not a problem. It's part of the scenario. Uh, the, 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 um, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, everybody. And have a good day. Okay, thank you. Thank you.